about this. It's 1971, we're two years after Woodstock, and you still, even after Woodstock, even after Altamont, even after um, Powder Ridge, you still have people that are interested in finding a field and bringing in 30 bands and recreating it. You know what, back in 71, 50,000 people showed up here. Heck, we can, we can barely keep milk on the shelf now. But we had 50,000 people. Come on, it, it's part of who you are. Well, you guys are gonna watch the documentary a little bit later on, so when I was asked to come out here and do this, I thought I don't wanna step on the documentary. I don't want to come out here and just simply talk about all the stuff that happened here at the Festival of Life and uh, sort of step on what the documentary is going to show you. So I decided to go a completely different way in this. Here's a question. It's 1971. What in the world made any human being believe they could put on an eight-day festival in the middle of Nowhereville, Louisiana, and get people and bands to come. Why would anybody believe such a thing was even possible? So that's what I'm gonna do. Let's talk about the history of festivals and why somebody would even think about putting together something like this. If we're gonna go all the way back to the beginning of festivals, we're probably gonna be in the 1950s, believe it or not, here in Louisiana. Anybody heard of the Swamp Pop festivals? They were maybe the earliest form of what was happening. In 1963, Leeds, happens over in the UK. Everybody see the, the record Live at Leeds? That with The Who, that was in 1970, but in 1968 or 63, the Leeds Festival began. The problem was they had 50,000 people and the audio couldn't touch it. The people couldn't hear the audio. So we gotta worry about the audio first. On July, 19, uh, July 1965, Bob Dylan goes electric at the Newport Folk Festival. Then it happens. Anybody know the name Bill Hanley? Ever heard the name Bill Hanley? He did the sound at Woodstock. And for Woodstock, you gotta remember, Woodstock was a half a million people. And they could all hear the music. Okay, how did it work? Bill Hanley is known as the father of festival sound, and what it was is he was traveling around with this jazz group, and because he was dealing with larger crowds, he was asked to come and play with the Beatles in Shea Stadium. So what happened was he goes out there and he had heard previous that the girls in the crowd were screaming so loud they were the same loudness as a power tool, 120 decibels. And that's loud as heck. Anybody remember the playoff game of the Saints with the really, really bad call? We'd have won that Super Bowl and you know we would have. But what happened was they tested the sound and it was only 126 decibels. So when the Beatles played Shea Stadium, they knew these girls were gonna be screaming and they couldn't run the shows like they normally ran them. So what Bill Hanley did was instead of setting up like a bar band like this, whereas the guitar is over there, so put the amp over there, the bass is over there, put the amp over there. What he did was took the speakers lifted them off of the ground and threw them over top of the audience. And furthermore, he compressed the living heck out of the sound, which means that that was soft and that that was loud was brought closer. The higher frequencies and lower frequencies were brought closer and he found he could throw it farther. Now the girls did scream and yell, but if you were in the top two tiers, it said the sound was amazing. And Bill starts to get work at all these different places, these different festivals, because he figured out how to throw sound to such a large audience. The Trips Festival comes around in 1966. That's out in San Francisco, California. And there's this fella by the name of Ken Babs. Ken Babs figures out how to make an amplifier louder. So what he did was it would make sense that if you have a 100 watt amplifier, you should have a 100 watt speaker. That's what it always was. You have a 50 watt amplifier, you get a 50 watt speaker. What Babs did was realize 
that if you have a 100 watt speaker and you take a 50 watt amplifier, you can turn that amplifier all the way up and the speaker will realize it. So 50 watts will go out louder than 100 watts through a 100 watt amplifier. So he set up at this TRIPS festival this new audio system of his and it was louder than anything anyone had heard previous. Also, did you hear at the beginning where the band had some feedback problems? This TRIPS guy figured out as well that you take the band and you get it as loud as you possibly can until it feeds back. You want that tone. You want it to go whoop. And once you have that tone, you can go into your graphic equalizer and pull it out. And now you can turn it up past where it would feed back. So now we've got how the sound is thrown. We've got how the sound got loud. So we need to start having some festivals. The Fantasy Fair and Magic Music Festival takes place 1967. 30,000 people, San Francisco, California, June 16th. 1967, Monterey Pop. Anybody remember Monterey Pop? That's where Jimi Hendrix lit his guitar on fire. That's Monterey Pop. Schaefer Music Festival happens in July 1966. Anybody? Schaefer Music Festival? That was the first free Central Park concert, which was one of the first festivals. The Northern California Folk Rock Festival occurs. Summerfest, 1968, Milwaukee. Newport Pop Festival, 1968, Cosimica, California. Then the LA Pop Festival, the Miami Pop Festival, and on and on and on. Now we're here to 1969. To this point, we have had less than 100,000 people. And furthermore, the people who came into the festival paid their money. So this thing was seen as profitable. So more and more festivals began. The Big Rock Pow Wow, Detroit Rock and Roll Revival, the Mississippi River Festival, the Atlantic City Pop Festival, August 1 through 3 in 1969, becomes the first festival to have 100,000 paying people. Okay, so this looks good. Welcome to Woodstock. 1969. How many tickets were supposed to be sold at Woodstock? Anybody? Anybody? 150,000. Cost you 22 per day. And they sold almost all 150,000 tickets before the concert even got underway. Bill Hanley was hired. They built the stage. I know you've never seen this happen because it broke the second they tried to use it. They built the stage as a giant Lazy Susan. So they could put one band on it while setting up another band, then turn it on and the whole thing would turn around and the next band would start. The problem is the moment that where they put it together, the moment they had people standing on it, they forgot to factor in the weight of the human beings. And it went and stopped working. Well, that's why there was so much space between bands. But what happened at Woodstock? Gate crashers. You don't have to pay. It was supposed to be 150 to 200,000 people, and there were half a million there. And the then the motorcycle gangs were there, and the drugs were there, and it was peace and love and wonderful. That's what everybody remembers. So if there's all those people, Woodstock must have made an insane amount of money, right? Oh, it was a massive financial failure. As a matter of fact, at the beginning of the second night, the bands who hadn't played screamed and yelled that they wanted to get paid in cash in order to go on stage. Now it's 11 o'clock at night. So what people had to do was get money out of a bank. So one of the people who did Woodstock was the heir to the Colgate fortune. So he put up his inheritance so the local bank would open up and would put seven, eight thousand dollars into brown paper bags so they could hand it to the people that were playing. Furthermore, when Woodstock was over, people weren't paid. What you had was a group of people that came in and felt the music should be free. And furthermore, it's called Woodstock because the people that put it together called themselves the Woodstock Contingent, but it was supposed to be in Wallkill. They told them no. It was supposed to be in Bethel. They told them no. It was only when they found a very nice uh, milk farmer, cow farmer, by the name of Max Yasger, that they were able to do it. 
The people who were running Woodstock went to Max Yasger and offered him $50 per day to use his farm. And he said, I may be a cow farmer, but I'm not stupid. <laughs> and he sat down and figured it out. When it was all over, they cut him a check for $75,000. Now the hippie, those that were at Woodstock, those were previous. It started through Woodstock, I get it, peace and love, but it started through Woodstock that the word hippie began to take on a bad connotation with some people. They saw them as those that would live in the mud, those that will not pay to get into, those that will crash the gates. And because of that, future festivals started having a tremendous amount of trouble finding a place to go. In fact, this festival was first supposed to be in Mississippi. Then it was supposed to be somewhere else. It was only here. And there was even opposition here to it. So that's where that all gets underway. The Vancouver Pop Festival comes August 22nd, 1969, 35,000 people. Texas International Pop Festival, the New Orleans Pop Festival in 1969. Prairieville, did you know there was another one? Anybody go to it? There you go. And then finally in 1969, anybody here uh, subscribe to Rolling Stone before it became a really bad magazine? Anybody? Rolling Stone made the statement, if Woodstock opened the Summer of Love, Altamont closed it. Altamont was the Rolling Stones making good on a concert that they missed out in California. But they decided to take it farther than that. The story goes that Mick Jagger decided, well, if they can have a Woodstock out east, why can't we have our own Woodstock out west? Anybody know the story of Altamont? It was, a, it was a failure from the beginning. Number one, not enough bands. It was only for one day. There wasn't enough food, there wasn't enough water, there wasn't enough toilets, but instead of fixing these things, what they did was just say it's for one day. They can live with it. Well, the people show up to Altamont Motor Speedway, this defunct racetrack. And the Rolling Stones manager, the, the story goes that they hired, the, Rolling, they hired uh, the Hells Angels to act as, um, to act as security. In reality, when they arrived, the Hells Angels were already there and had already ringed themselves around the stage. They were running on generators. So what happened was, the head of the Rolling Stones came out and said, fellas, would you do me a favor and just sort of act as crowd control and make sure nobody touches the generators? And the guy who was in charge of the San Francisco chapter of the uh, Hells Angels, Ralph Sonny Barger, he said to him, that's fine, we'll do it, but what do you give to me? He said, I got 500 in my pocket, you can have all the backstage beer, how's that? That was the deal. What the Hells Angels were doing was instead of saying, would you please move back they were punching people. They had pool cues that they had broken off in the midsection. And they were smacking people in the head and smacking people in the teeth to get them to go back. When the Jefferson Airplane took the, play, it took the stage, the people who were playing in the band, Marty Ballin specifically, was saying to, the, saying to the Hells Angels, what are you doing? Why are you bothering these people? And one of the Hells Angels promptly punched Mally ba Marty Ballin right in the face and dropped him right there. The rhythm guitarist, Yorma Korkinen, calms him down and gets the thing back on stage. The Rolling Stones come up and start to play. Do you know the song, um, American Pie? As I saw him on the stage, my hands were clenched in fists of rage. No angel born in hell, hell's angels, could break that Satan smell. And as the fire grew into the night to light the sacrificial rite, I saw Satan laughing with delight. A lot of people have argued about that line, but it's pretty obvious they're talking about the Altamont uh, Motor Speedway concert. Okay, so who's Satan? Well, Satan is Mick Jagger, because the story goes that this young man named Meredith Hunter was stabbed to death in front of Mick Jagger, right there in front of the stage. And they were playing Sympathy for the Devil, and Mick Jagger was laughing while it happened. Have any of you heard that story? Absolutely untrue, absolutely untrue. As a matter of fact, the Stones were trying to get off the stage. 
up on the stage was Mick Jagger and he's yelling, be cool babies, be cool my babies, be cool my babies. He's got his long sleeves on to hide his track marks. Be cool baby, be cool my babies. Well, at one point in time, the band said, F this, and just walked off the stage. The story goes that Ralph Sonny Barger took a 38 snub nose pistol, put it right between Keith Richards' eyes, and said, play or die. Richard said he thought for about two seconds and went, play. <laughs> they went back up on stage. <laughs> Meredith Hunter was not stabbed during the song Sympathy for the Devil. He was stabbed during the song Under My Thumb. Was, um, was Mick Jagger laughing? Yeah, because he didn't know. He didn't know that it was happening. And furthermore, this guy, Meredith Hunter, probably shot at Mick Jagger. If you watch the, uh, the documentary, Gimme Shelter, this guy, Meredith Hunter, you can't miss him. He's in a white suit, big hat, pulls out this chrome-plated pistol, gets to about here, and there's a flash at the end of it. Either it's fire or it's light glinting off. And he shoots up at Mick Jagger. There's a couple stories behind that. Number one, that he, Meredith Hunter, was high on PCP, and his girlfriend said something like, oh, that Mick Jagger's cute. And as a drug-induced person, he decided to go up and shoot him. The other is that he stopped taking it from the Hells Angels. And what he did was start to fight back with them. And when he got to the point where they weren't taking it from him anymore, when they chased him, he was running away, pulled out his gun, and shot at them. If he shot at all. But they stabbed him to death right there in front of it. And Rolling Stone covered it, and it got the worst press. And by the end of 1969, because Altamont was in December, the idea of the festival itself had run into trouble. In 1970, there were 48 festivals planned in the United States. 30 of them were shut down by the local government using injunctions and pulling permits. So you've got now this, instead of peace and love, you have this concern of these people showing up and crashing the gate and leaving the place as bad as they could. It's said that Max Yasger's farm couldn't produce milk for three years. The cleanup was close to $100,000 to get his farm back to usable, you know, usable space. The idea of the festival is dying, and a lot of people make the statement that it was because of Altamont. I don't think so. I think it was because of Powder Ridge. Powder Ridge? Anybody? Oh, this is a fantastic story. Let's throw a party and no one will come, okay? It's called Powder Ridge because it took place in Connecticut on the side of a ski mountain, Powder Ridge Ski Resort, okay? It was supposed to be three days of bands and love and music and the people who were in charge of the little town threw an injunction 48 hours before the concert was about to start. Except nobody bothered to tell all the people who had tickets. So 30,000 people showed up, and there were no bands. None. The only people that played, you guys know who Melanie is? I got a brand new pair of roller skates, you got a brand new key. Right, that's Melanie. By the way, just for the sake of argument, Melanie, do you guys, how many of you, you can't do it anymore, how many of you went to concerts when you were younger and literally lit a lighter to show? You know, now you have to use your phone because fire bad. So a lot of people, it's, it's impossible to say where it started, but a lot of people believe it was Melanie that started it at Woodstock when she passed around candles after the rain had stopped and asked everybody to light the candles and hold them up to keep the rain away. A woeful misunderstanding of meteorology, but something cute, and it looks like it, it looks like it took off from that point. But Powder Ridge was only supposed to take about 20 bucks a day, and all these people showed up, 30,000 people, they got to hear Melanie and like three local bands. Somebody go out there and play, do something. The drugs, apparently, had started to get worse. It wasn't just grass anymore. Now it was hallucinogens, it was LSD, it was heroin. And the drug dealers, they showed up. 
And the doctors that were there said in Woodstock, look, we were just giving people a place to sit down for a while. Now they're trying to save lives. And this further scared a lot of people. And the idea of NIMBY, anybody heard of NIMBY? Not in my backyard, <laughs> right. NIMBY starts to take over from this thing. So what happens then? To offer a festival seemed to be something like, I have a ton of cash. How can I lose it? Because they just weren't making any money. Furthermore, you had what the local people, the local government believed was an undesirable group to show up. The word hippie had taken on such a bad connotation. In Oregon, they decide to do Vortex One. It's gonna be the first, and by the way, to this date, the only state-sponsored festival. It was supposed to be peace and love, so they would stop people from political fighting, political arguments. I mean, this idea of Donald Trump's always been around. And Oregon, this is gonna be great. And everybody, this is wonderful, we'll listen to your thing. Hey, by the way, we're bringing in President Nixon. The, the people who ran it heard through the crowd that if Nixon shows up, we're going to riot. If Nixon shows up, we're going to try to get him. And so what they had to do was stop it. They so I said, Nixon is not coming. And they got some more bands to play. And since then, no other state has set it up. The violence was out there. Now we're in 1971. Festival of life, right? Think about it. You're going to go into a place in Louisiana, and you're going to do eight days of this. There was going to be a Ferris wheel. There was an elephant. Have you seen the elephant? Who was there? Who saw the elephant? Anybody see the tightrope walker? Oh, it was little circus things that went on and all that. But it was just part of something towards the end of the festival's going. The Ozark Music Festival in 1974 was held in July. 50,000 tickets were sold, 350,000 people got in. It was another Woodstock. Local farmers said they were taking their pigs and their cows and killing them right there and cooking them. <laughs> Go. What was believed to be the last of the big festivals was the California Jam 1974. Highest paid attendance yet, 250,000 people. And then it starts to die completely. Because of, because of Lollapalooza, because of um, the Lilith Fair, because of OzFest, it would seem that festivals just kept going the whole way through. But they did not. They died about 1974, except for a few that took a shot at it in the 1980s. Anybody remember the Us Festival? The Us Festival? Steve Wozniak put it on the guy who was so ungodly rich from Microsoft, for a very short time, Van Halen, thanks to Steve Wozniak, was the highest paid band for a single concert ever. Why? Because David Lee Roth was on a ship going down the Amazon with his friends. And he got a radio call that said, look, there's this us vessel they wanted to play. And Dave says, look, we want a million and a half dollars for an hour and a half's worth of work, or we ain't coming. No one's gonna pay that, right? Yes, he did. A million and a half dollars for 90 minutes of performance. And Van Halen was the highest paid band ever until, I think it was 17 hours later, when David Bowie became the highest paid. Because David Bowie said to Steve Wozniak, look, I gotta fly a plane from London. So they paid him an additional $25,000. So there you have it. It was three days, no concerns. And Steve Wozniak lost $22 million. His answer, I got it. That's what he said. I got it. No concerns. Okay, Live Aid. Anybody remember watching Live Aid? It took place in Philadelphia, it took place in London. Phil Collins played at both of them. He got on the Concorde and flew over and sang at both of them. That was a fantastic success, wasn't it? Was it? How much money did it raise? Now you watched it. How much money did you give? Huh? Huh? It was supposed to raise billions for hunger in Africa, specifically Ethiopia. It made $40 million. If everybody that watched 
had given a dollar, it would have made billions. But it made $40 million. To this date, it's only made $156 million. I know that's a lot of money, but think about it, it was a global event. It should have made more money. Did you know there were two other Woodstocks? There was Woodstock 94 and Woodstock 99. Woodstock 94, it rained all three days. Woodstock 99 took place in Rome, New York at a defunct uh, Air Force base. Apparently, the kids were being so bilked that waters were about seven bucks a bottle, and they got tired of it. And this band, anybody heard of a band called Limp Biscuit? Yeah? Limp Biscuit has a song called Break Stuff. And it's, that's, that's the song. I'm so angry at the world today. Break Stuff. And the lead singer comes out, and he says, you ever had one of those days when you just want to break something? Everybody at the festival wanted to break something. And that's where it kicked off. They rioted. They tore the place down. They lit it on fire. It was, a, I mean, big problems. By the way, there was supposed to have been a Woodstock 50. Did you know that? There was going to be a Woodstock this year. Anybody heard what happened? Anybody? Mm. One of the original Woodstock people put it together. And he put up multi-millions of dollars, this little nest egg of about $30 million. It's all set up. It's ready to go. He's hired this Japanese firm to promote it, and he's hired this other firm to sell the tickets. Well, in those contracts with those people, it said, we're going to sell this many tickets, or you get paid a bit of money just for your, just for your you know, problem, just for your, your concern. About two months ago, if I do the mathematics correctly, they had all their permits pulled. Woodstock just pulled all the permits. Then the Japanese company went into the coffers and took their 19 million. Then the other group went in there and took the other multiple millions because they thought the concert was over and cleaned out the whole thing. That's the reason there's not going to be a Woodstock 50. There's no money because the two place, the two companies they hired took all of the money themselves and left. That's truth. That's the truth. But look, you wait around long enough and everything becomes hip again. Honest to goodness, I, I didn't know I was supposed to dress in 1971, 1960s clothing. I feel totally overdressed. I feel like, you know, oh, look, the professor has a collared shirt on, you know? I should have worn some of my tie-dye, and I have a bunch of it. If you wait around long enough, everything becomes hip again. In 1991, Lollapalooza occurs. Anybody been to Jazz Fest? Jazz Fest? Oh, it's great. It's great. How many of you have listened to a lot of jazz at Jazz Fest? But, <laughs> but think about it. Where does it take place? It's enclosed, isn't it? What kind of police protection was there when you went in? Oh, it's quite, it's, it is basically a concert outside of a concert hall. Multiple stages, I get it, but a concert outside of a concert hall. That was the idea. They looked back and saw everything that had a problem with festivals to begin with, and the festivals of 1991, Lollapalooza, Lilith, and Bonnaroo, then Coachella, Monsters of Rock, all of them have turned it into... Can you kind of show it? I got something to say. Did I upset him or something? No? Okay. Crowds, crowds are within a space, and about 15,000 people tops come into them. So we have the festivals. But when you look back at it, it's such a wonderful, fun history. And the one thing to be spectacularly proud of is you were part of it. You were part of it. You saw it happen. I didn't. I have students say to me all the time, Dr. Burns, what was Woodstock like? Well, I was three years old. It was, my needs were basically taken care of most of the day. So, I, 
I didn't want to step on the documentary because it is really a wonderful little half hour and you're really going to enjoy it. But I just wanted to say, how did we get here? How would such an idea as coming out to a field, eight days, eight days, and setting it up with music, how could you come to that realization? And it's because that's what was going on at the time. And the problem is, we were kind of at the end or of that 1970s run. Or it may have had much more of a different outcome. Okay? Please enjoy the documentary. Thank you for listening to me. I so like it.
PA system and uh, Taylor Fry, Sam McCock were kind of the ones that put the band together. Taylor has some band makes here and then Dad kind of pulled together a couple other local musicians to kind of come and entertain everybody. Um, Taylor's got a concert coming up this week at the Roots, so y'all like hearing Taylor play go to the 4th of July at the Roots. Listen to Taylor and seven more bandmates, right, that play it. So more than you've seen right here, and it's amazing. Fiddle player, mandolin player, they're, they're really good. So right now we're going to give everybody about 10 minutes and you can get up, stretch your legs, go to the bathroom. Uh, we'll get the documentary started in about 10 or 15 minutes. There's, in the back table, there's popcorn and uh, m &Ms. So what movie is not good without popcorn and m &Ms? And uh, one more recognition. Check one, two, three, hello, check. Checking the one, two. Levels are good. Just whenever you're ready. <laughs> Here we are in the old, old Pete's Place Saloon in Fort McCampett, Texas. I went to work for Stephen Steele's the 1st of June in 1971. One night, still said, we're going to go to Louisiana. I said, why? He said, we're going to play the Festival of Life. Well, we got there, and the place was, it was all you could see was these lights in the swamp. And we landed, went backstage, there was still like a posh in this dressing room, and we hung out for about an hour and went on stage, and, and I could smell the crowd. I couldn't see a thing because of the lights. I could smell them in the land and the weed being burned. It wasn't a bad smell. We began to play and uh, and played about an hour and got off stage and flew back to Baton Rouge. We had missed the Learjet. We sat there until dawn waiting for an airplane to fly to uh, Memphis. It was an experience not to be forgotten. And uh, folks died in that swamp. It was nasty, nasty. It was a festival of death, it seemed like to me. We lived through it. Thank God for that. There started to be murmurs about this festival that was going to take place in somewhere in Louisiana. It's not the Rock Fest, as the press loves to call it. It's a youth fair. You get a number of youth, 60,000 youth out. We're providing with a lot of entertainment, a lot of activities, a lot of things going on. And this is the concept of celebration. And uh, the first time I heard it on the radio, and when I heard it for the first time, people were already kind of trickling in on their way to, uh, to the rock festival, supposedly at uh, uh, what we call Cypress Point. I'd worked on Altamont before that, and I was like low man on the totem pole. But I was lucky enough to be involved and do what I did in a few other concerts. And at the time, my grandmother owned the property adjacent to Cypress Point, which we're standing on right now. And at the time, my aunt and uncle lived up here. And uh, so we were kind of concerned to figure out what's going on. Uh, if, if I'm not mistaken, I think I saw a poster around, the, uh, I think in Baton Rouge, I believe, I saw uh, the bands that were supposed to be there. And the lineup at this festival that was, that was taking place was just phenomenal. I mean, you had everybody from the Allman Brothers Band, Chambers Brothers, Stephen Stills, Linda, uh, Linda Ronstadt. Blood Rock was supposed to be there. 
and uh, it's a beautiful day. Amboy Dukes, there, Ted Nugent and Amboy Dukes. And uh, probably a, a few others, War without Eric Burden. I've got them written all down. It's just, I, I really don't remember them all. I'd like to, but I don't. I ended up dealing with a gentleman called Lou Weinstock, who was the really the producer of that concert. And Ron Goldstein, who was also out there, was into the lighting aspect and filming. He was into everything. Ron wanted to do it all, man. Uh, there was a fellow by the name of Stephen Caplow, who was the promoter. I saw him a few times. He was a young guy, must have been like maybe 27, 28. And I guess his family had a lot of money, and he was the promoter of the festival. The guy that actually owned the property, from what I remember, didn't have a lot to do with it other than leasing it to this promoter. Yes, yeah, the farmer owned it. It was a um, uh, where he grew his crops, you know, and he decided that that period of time was a good time for us to have an, an event. And did you say where was it? Uh, it was in uh, around Morganza, around the New Roads Morganza area in a little town called McCray. Uh, McCray is an upper, upper, what they call Upper Point Compete Parish. It's on the banks of the Atchafalaya River. The easiest way to describe it is if you're coming into a Point Compete Parish across the Simsport Bridge, you turn on the river road and it's nine miles down the road. Flying out there from Baton Rouge just scared the hell out of me. I knew where I was, but I didn't know where I was. <laughs> okay, yeah, you got to think about where they have put this thing. I mean, you know, when, when, if, if you look at the big picture on this, they could not have found a more obscure, tucked away, hard to get to, out of touch, away from everything else on earth, uh, you know, place. We rolled in and barreled in there. That was our third stop, because they had moved us twice before that. Yeah, well, I, uh, part of the reason, I guess, uh, that uh, we got caught by surprise because this group had been turned away from a, a couple other sites, so we heard after the fact. We didn't know it at the time. In the long run, they couldn't stop us because we were legal. We'd been there, and the farmer said the land could be used, and they couldn't kick us off that one. The others, they did because they got the people who own the land to say, no, 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 okay, we don't want them. It takes about a month to set up a festival, but we'll try to do it in about three days. We're gonna try hard. <laughs> Can I be done? Sure. There's a lot of good people here, man, a lot of good vibes. They want to work and they, they want this thing to come off, so it's gonna come off, you know. The National Guard didn't want it there. They all wanted us to move. They were flying in and out going, you can't stay here. And we're going, yes, we're staying. And we just kept building. atmosphere at this event was pretty calm. Even with all the problems that there was, everybody really was calm. To me, most of the people were getting stoned, having a good time, brother, and, and being left alone. They weren't there to have fights. There, it was just scattered stuff going on. So I just started getting involved in these scattered things that were going on that I had experience in from Altamont, from when I worked there. There's been a great deal of work on it, a great deal of uh, time and energy has gone into it. We had had the proper papers. We had uh, met the sanitation requirements. If I, if I were going to get together with you guys and, hey, let's do a festival, we can get... We'll try to get all these bands together, and then we'll sell a bunch of tickets. Who knows? We might make you know a lot of money. 
the first thing I'm going to do is check it out with the locals, the local authorities, uh, the local residents. Well, it was kind of <coughs> hard for us to conceive because we had a real small uh, group of deputies, and uh, I don't think we could even imagine how large it eventually got to be. Yeah, you have to kind of get a mind's picture of this. You're suddenly going to bring down tens of thousands of hippies into this isolated area, which is going to be very difficult. So you've got to imagine them all along the roadways, trying to find their ways there. Lots of hitchhikers and beat up vans, you know, migrating to this very isolated spot. Well, as the days progressed and people started filing in here, the authorities and the, uh, decided that they weren't going to let people on the site because they didn't have sanitary conditions, didn't have whatever, they didn't have whatever the things that they needed to sustain people who were coming in from all over the country. They made it very clear they did not want this festival to happen. But because we had the permits and because we were legal, they would do everything they could to stop us in every manner including flying in the, the army guy and the colonel guys telling us they're not going to let us have food and water. But what happened was, is they wound up l people lining the highways and byways of Point Capi, of Voiles, even into West Baton Rouge Parish, into St. Landry Parish on 190, lining the roads for miles and miles and miles. And these people were out, stuck out on the side of the street. People were just, it was, there were a lot of people, cars everywhere, but, uh, but nobody was getting into the festival. So I just started taking pictures of the, what was happening on the outside. And then somebody gave me a, a pass or a badge, like a press pass to get in and out. You know, everybody was smoking pot. Uh, there was lots of psychedelics available openly for sale, which I was kind of, I kind of was freaked out about that because I kept waiting any minute for like, you know, a huge bunch of cops to come in and just arrest, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people. Well, that never happened. Well, they, they had some, uh, and I really don't know how many was there, but they had some undercover fellas that was there. The undercover cops would stand there with the sheriff and the state police and point out the people that were passing the drugs around and doing it, and they would arrest them as they would leave the place. Didn't cause a stink or anything else. We did have some ODs, of course. Um, you're going to get them, I don't care, you get them today in shows. Anyway, while they were doing that dope trading, I was selling wine and beer and trying to keep them hydrated. You know, I was doing the right thing. <laughs> the few businesses are in this area, a few grocery stores and stuff, those people made a ton of money. Uh, Mr. Duke Rogers owned a little store right around the corner up here about a half a mile away. And I know he told me that he had made, he did very well selling Cokes and beer and bread and, and just uh, essentials for a uh, thing. And they couldn't keep up with the demand. I remember water was really hard to come across and probably expensive uh, when we did find it. We brought canteens and of course that lasted, you know, in that kind of heat, our canteens I think were empty like the next morning or something, you know. Because of not being able to bring in the right supplies that we wanted and when we were supposed to, we had to makeshift a lot of stuff. They had no water. My daddy, uh, we were raised in the cattle business, we always had portable uh, water tanks. And uh, he had some of his men off, of, off the farm haul water, you know, from the deep water wells that we had on our property to the McCray area uh, across the levee and, and to these kids and he had it rigged up with a water faucet and where they could go there and get water. A group of people told us we couldn't go on, a, on a, our own property and uh, I said, well, uh, who are you? And they said, well, we are the Galloping Gooses from New Orleans. I said, yeah, so what? What does that mean? He said, we're a motorcycle gang out of New Orleans and we're hired by their promoters to keep people out off the site and make sure that they go through the gate. And he said, we just got through whipping a boy's ass and we're getting ready to whip some more. I was told that they were raping some of these women and, and uh, robbing some of them. So I told the, the sheriff about it. 
and he got to tell me he had his grease gun that he carried during World War II. And uh, he got the state police and the old deputies and they got the galloping gooses together and drove them out of town. There were um, altercations and scuffles um, with cops and bikers. And I remember witnessing a real bad altercation at the front gate with cops, uh, you know, kind of beating on people. The officials that were there, the police that were there, they didn't want us there, but they did do their jobs. I personally never saw any officer physically harm anyone. Uh, their intentions were, were good. Law enforcement uh, just didn't know what to expect. And at the time, uh, they didn't know how many people were coming. So they thought probably the best way to, uh, you know, to, to stop this thing, because nobody wanted it, everybody was afraid of it. There was no reason to hang out by the stage because they were still erecting the stage and putting up the sound system, the towers and all that stuff. There was an accident during Celebration Life. There was a huge thunderstorm one day and the workers were on the scaffolding and at that time I was very close to the stage and I saw what was probably the most horrific accident in my entire life. One of the sound towers came down. One of the fellows that was working on it got hurt bad. One of the scaffoldings literally went in one side and came out the other. And he was laying there on the ground, conscious, with his eyes open, with a thick, huge scaffolding pole all the way through his body. We thought he was dead and got him to the hospital. It was a miracle. I believe he lived, um, and uh, I, I, mean, I think it missed every major whatever in his body, and he lived to tell the tale later. At one point, the National Guard came in, flew in with the colonel or whoever he was, telling us that they said, one of us had to go out and tell those people to turn around and go back. And I said, well, I got to tell you, nobody here is going to do that. I'm not going out there and tell that. 60,000 people out there waiting on the roadsides. They can't come in and see a music festival. They've been waiting for for how many weeks now? They finally decided that there weren't any sanitary conditions along the highway, so they might as well put them into one place. And they let the, opened up the point and let people come on here to, uh, to go to the uh, rock festival and to let them have it. They finally realized we were going to do a show, and they finally let open the gates. The music started at six at night, went till six in the morning. That was the coolest time. During the day, you stayed in the river or tried to find shade and get out of the sun, because man, it was hot, brother. We're sleeping in a, a pup tent. Got out of the tent, you know, and I'm just kind of looking at what everybody else is. And mostly you could just see millions of joints, like little glowing things just flaring up all over. It was that part was I'd never seen that before. Now when you book a show or you book an artist, you're booking him for a certain date, certain time slot. So when you start moving this big concert from one parish to the next, you start having problems with those dates because they're already booked ahead of time most of the time. Long story short, uh, I think 80% of the bands that were scheduled to play didn't show up. So we did lose Zach's. It was not something that the promoters had planned on. It's not something that Lou desired to happen. <laughs> we did everything possible so it wouldn't happen. So we told the people we'd have somebody come up and tell jokes. Uh, what you couldn't imagine, it was some of the craziest stuff in the world on that stage going on, okay? They had a huge stage just like you would see it, just like it was at, uh, up in New York, and you had the loudspeakers that you could hear for a mile away and everything else, and they had, a, they had, some, had some nice acts, as I remember. The music of this festival was probably the thing that saved it. 
The artists that we did get for the show, they did an excellent job. They did the best job they could because they knew they had their hands full. They had a whole bunch of people out there by the thousands that had been waiting and waiting and waiting. And it rained for a while, it got windy at some points, and over a six day period of music and everything else in nature, the musicians are the ones that we should praise the most because every show they did rock. We went early and hung out in the festival. It was wet and muddy. Muddy as hell, really, no, very still air, very heavy humidity, no breeze, mosquitoes, um, just not conducive to, you know, sleeping out under the stars. The, the main thing that stuck in my mind about the people that were moving about was not simply, you know, their clothing or absence thereof, but was unlike some of the rock festivals that I went to later and things, there just wasn't a lot of happiness. You didn't see a lot of people walking around with a festive type look about them. Now I'm sure they were there and we didn't get all the way up near where the stage was and they were probably having just a blast there. But most of the people further back that we were seeing, if it wasn't downright despair, it was concern, it was fatigue, it was uh, over being overheated. We had areas where they had just flooded it up with water and turned it into mudslide areas, but the biggest problem they found was there was too much rock and stone in it. So it ended up being more, they'd cake themselves up with mud and walk around with mud and then go get in the river and wash off. It was so damned hot and so sticky. It was like June. Uh, and if you've ever been to Louisiana in June, then I don't have to say anything else. It was, uh, it was a huge feast for the mosquitoes. We have spent a great deal of money on mosquito control programs. Uh, all the minor details, everybody screams and hollers about and says these rock tests are disasters, this, that, and the other. We have attended to. Hundreds, if not thousands of people were just totally naked on the levee, in the water. The rednecks would be passing by in their boats with their binoculars. And, uh... and, and they came up the river and they were taking pictures. A lot of my friends from the Marksville area, they were jumping in the river. Come on over, Carl. Bring, leave that old ugly dog over there. All the locals that didn't come to the festival brought their boats out, though, and sat on the river and watched all the naked people. And my daddy looked at it and he says, Charles, he says, I don't know if I can condemn these people for skinny dipping. He says, I did the same thing growing up in the same place. The only trouble was I didn't have 40,000 people watching me. Being, again, a, a whatever I was, 17-year-old male, I spent most of my time by the river watching the girls swimming, skinny dipping in the Atchafalaya. It was the first time in my life I had seen a naked woman. <laughs> and, and you know, I was simply jaw dropped. And there, it wasn't just like one, there were many of them. So you can't help it if the, the band didn't make it because their van broke down or whatever. But all this other bullshit, you know, oh, four days later, what we were supposed to start, you know, finally started and not in that kind of heat. Just that one factor alone for several days is, is insane. I mean, like I said, I ha I, surely I'm not the only one who became disgruntled and said, you know what, y'all have a good time, see ya. The way we live in South Louisiana is in the summer, is you move from one air conditioner to the next. The humidity is a huge issue, you know. These people are going to go out there, the, the festival is scheduled to be for eight days and stay in a spot where there's no air conditioning at all and no relief from the heat except that raging river right there on the side, which is a death trap. I know of no one I have ever met who would willingly get in and swim in the Atchafalaya River. Anyone that sees it sees that's going to be dangerous, but that was the only relief relief from the heat for them. People were told it's a dangerous river. 
They were told that if they were going to go in, not to really go out too far, that it was fairly safe along the shoreline. I think there were a lot of uh, folks, a lot of youngsters there that were, you know, maybe from the north or from the west coast or whatever, that were used to swimming in, you know, maybe not muddy, swift, raging, you know, death trap uh, bodies of water. You put that many people together, something, a baby get born maybe, uh, somebody's going to break their arms, something's going to happen. It's just nature. Being in the, in the, the funeral industry, I have a friend, uh, a co-worker, former co-worker, who was working at that time in uh, the little funeral home in uh, uh, New Roads, which is just right up the road from where all this took place. He was on the subject one day and telling me about the bodies that they were pulling out uh, of the river there. He assured me that there were people that drowned there, according to the coroner's office, that, that reportedly went under and never surfaced back up and no one knew who they were because they just were somebody who hitchhiked down for the festival. A guy had drowned while we were there and um, although I won't say that we got up close enough to actually see the body. Uh, they were talking about it. And they were pulling the body behind a boat. The arm was up like this in the air. A rope was tied to the arm. And rather than having pulled the, the, the guy into the boat with them to haul him back, they were dragging him through the water. I'm not pointing a finger or blaming the promoters, or I'm not blaming anybody for anything, but I think that some of the locals or whoever owned the property or what have you should have maybe had the foresight to maybe put some, some signs up saying, you know, very dangerous current. Uh, you could put a no swimming sign up, which of course would have been immediately burned in a campfire or whatever. But there should have been, I don't know, I, I just, like I said, there's no telling how many people drowned that, you know, their mom and dad never saw them again after that, never had a clue what happened to them. I have no, no idea about the drownings. Uh, Lou and I never talked about it. Ron never talked about it. Um, you had your hands full. Yeah, we had it, more than full. Um. Trying to feed people was a handful. When they finally, uh, finally considered the, uh, you know, the, the deal over with, hell, these folks were hitchhiking home and trying to find a way to get home with no money or anything. And hell, they left automobiles, they left guitars, they left uh, amplifiers, you, you name it, they left it out in the field. It was just all across the field. It looked like a Civil War battlefield out there. The eight-day festival, the, the festival, the, the ambition of building an eight-day festival, it excites me to this day, okay? I'm going to tell you now. It can't be done eight days, three max is all I think you can do now. That's, that's, a, that's a, a big danger. You lose your ass doing that too, easy. One day is hard to do. Uh, I think that you, you really kind of have to you know, give it a little more thought and, and, and maybe some research and, you know what I mean, to just to kind of look forward a little bit as to, well, now what am I getting myself into? And what am I getting all these thousands of people into? Yeah, that was pretty heavy duty, eight days. But it could have been done and it could have been, and it can, still can be done as long as it's planned out and people don't start backstepping on you 
and doing things that aren't supposed to be going on. A lot of the guys weren't professional promoters. Um, they're college guys. They really didn't expect it to be what it turned into. You don't prepare for things. You don't realize you got to have a drug tent. You got to have, you know, somebody's going to overdose. You don't realize that people are going to get sunburned beyond belief. You don't ever think about drown somebody drowning in a river. The way things transpired, from what I could hear from rumor control, if you will, is that basically he has absconded with the money. I don't know if he ever got caught or what happened there on what the final outcome on that was. But uh, basically it was a, a get rich quick money scheme from the promoter. I got to tell you something. The way that was all put together, I would never do a show that way. When, when you have a certain amount of money to spend, and then you find you have to keep doubling that because the legal system says, oh no, after they said yes, that presents the biggest problems. It was uh, an episode that every person ought to see at least one time in their life. Once would be enough, but uh, it certainly one time was a good time. I wouldn't trade with the experience. I did it and lived through it. Thank God for both of them. Uh, I don't know. It was just, it seemed to be a cursed event, I guess. It's probably the most succinct way I can word it. They'd have left us alone. We'd have ro we did rock their world. Okay? I don't care what any, if anybody out there complains, I'm really sorry, okay? We did the best job we could do, and I believe we rocked your world.